Welcome to Pool Party, which we have not seen in a little while. It's been a it's been a minute since I've been able to see a Pool Party game. And we have ourselves a classic 2v2 with some classic players that some of you watching the channel may not be familiar with. If you've watched in the last couple of years, some of these names are not going to be as familiar to you as they are to me. Whoa, I just noticed kind of a weird thing. Uh, all right, in the north, playing the uh, Empire, this is Superpower. To the south, his teammate playing the Soviets, this is JJ. On the opposite side of the map, playing Red, playing Empire, this is Fordell. And in the north, playing Soviets, playing Orange, this is Chris. There we go. We've got ourselves the new drive interface, the new drive design for this 2v2, the first test of this style. And uh, hey, we'll see if it works. We'll see if it needs to be fixed. Um, well, I noticed that when players were building walls in the beginning of the game, their income was reporting like two which I think, I think might be a bug, their total resources gathered, with canceling walls. I don't know, that's kind of weird, but uh, we'll see. Uh, pretty early aggression coming out here from Fordell. He's going for the crush, he's going for the kill. That bonsai charge actually worked out pretty well, and it defended this Defender VX, who's been able to get up completely established here. Fortunately, the Sickles from GG have found the opening, they've found the weakness here on the north side of the barracks, and he's going to block off with the wall, and the barracks goes down. So this attack almost worked from Fordell, but it just doesn't quite find the damage that he was hoping for. Oh, I love that block of the wall with that Imperial Warrior, and then he just blocks in the Imperial Warrior with a wall on the outside. Defender Core here is a big help, and it is not a parade push across the map, but there is a reinforcing barracks there in the middle. Fordell going for the push, going for the aggression. And oh, by the way, uh, this game is from 2015. I had a replay in my email that someone sent from 2015. And now walls coming in from multiple players. Superpower getting in on the wall action, trying to help out his ally with some additional walls to block off that Defender VX Corps. Meanwhile, Superpower has gone tier two. He's gone for strikers, gets a kill on a Tangu as they traverse over top of the base. And his own Tangus are gonna be giving chase, hoping to save that Harvester from too much pain. Chris, on the mean in the meantime, has had a free third refinery set up in the middle of the map there at that water location. And uh, the old leech the hammer tank off of your own building so that you can regen some HP because you're playing Soviets and you don't have a Crusher Crane yet trick. It's a classic trick from me. Days of Red Alert 3. Bullfrog goes down, Hammer Tank gonna get jumped on as well, and it barely gets eliminated before those strikers transform. Nicely done there by Superpower. That was like the perfect number of rockets. And this is a bit unfortunate for GG that he is having to sacrifice so much health from his War Factory onto those Hammer Tanks. But that is one of the nice things about the Leech Beam. You can just trade a little bit of money in repairs for that health on your hammer tanks at a moment's notice. Hammer tanks moving in for Chris. And Superpower, I don't think, has gone for a third. He's the only player, I think, that doesn't have a third refinery up and running. He uh, may not even have an oil derrick in a moment if this uh, attack keeps up from Chris. All right, third refinery coming up there from Superpower. So he is going to have that eventually. But uh, not, just, just not yet. He doesn't have it set up yet. Hammer tank about to go double gun. No, oh, one hammer tank does go down. The other two are gonna have to divide up that tsunami tank's gun. And Chris has not quite realized the danger he was under. 
and as a result he will pay the price with a couple of these hammer tanks a couple of uh terror drones coming in trying to throw a wrench into the works gg trying to shut down this attack and help out superpower but it didn't quite work out as he had hoped tangu's going down fordell has well established his three refineries he might be looking for a fourth in his somewhat aggressive position to keep up the push push and keep up the pressure yes indeed 2015 yeah that's that's when this game is from it's been a while but that's you know fordell hasn't played a lot recently superpower i don't know if he's played a lot recently uh and then Gigi, i have not seen at all in years and years and years chris i don't think i've seen chris in a year or two in terms of games so yeah this is definitely it's an old game i don't know how it it either you know someone just emailed it to me uh not that long ago but all of the other games are from like the end of 2022 so you know they're they're nearing a year old but not seven eight years old like this one Tangu's getting the kill there. A little bit of harassment from Superpower, but it does get shut down by Fordell. Fordell helping Chris out here, helping him maintain that solid income. Very even income across the board. Superpower may be a little bit weaker than the rest, about 400 credits per minute behind everyone else. And uh, not a, you know, not a huge difference, but it certainly does add up over time but not to very much at the current moment. And Superpower, if he loses this, oh, the refinery gets infected. An amazing move there for any Soviet player. It will get healed up. It will be denied. The kill there will be denied, but every Soviet player dreams of getting the Terror Drone infect on a refinery core. And hey, it delays the refinery. It's not a big deal. It is a little bit of a win there though. For Chris, he gets a little bit of a uh, mental win over his opponent. Fourth refinery under threat. GG did have a pretty fast third refinery, so his fourth refinery may be a little bit slow. However, it's uh, it's not a big deal overall. He should be fine as long as he doesn't lose everything. Chris, on the other hand, Chris wants to keep up that attack in the north. Fordell's got that refinery on the middle of the map that just got harassed by some Tangus. Hammer tanks once again getting chewed up by those tsunamis. And the Terror Drone, in fact, from the side. Terror Drone from Chris trying to make its way to the front line. Tangus flying over the base of Gigi. Gonna go for the transform. Won't get the bullfrog, it looks like, but they're going to turn around and go for the kill somewhere else. Middle of the map fight may be coming up between Fordell and Gigi. This map getting sliced and diced into different pieces as players divide their armies amongst all of these land routes and look for a better angle of engage. Hammer tank shows up and... Okay, I mean, I, I don't think those tangus really got very much value for uh for how many of them there were they probably would have been better off just one tangu dropping on every harvester instead of killing a barracks over the course of like a minute oil derrick finally going down the first oil derrick of the game to fall uh eight minutes and 50 seconds closing in on the nine minute mark there tank busters pushing forward point defense drones have just expired which means they're ready to go once again Big cluster of units. This is a lot of hammer tanks on the Soviet side. Now in the north, Chris is pushing up against superpower. Once again, Fordell and Chris, they are the aggressors overall in this game. They, they have dealt with some harassment on the back end, but overall they have been the ones pushing to try and do some damage. We'll see if they're actually able to get it done. Chris has not had much success against the tsunami tanks of superpower. He has been defeated pretty much every time the hammer tanks have gone up against the tsunami tanks. And he gets two tsunami tanks basically for free. Tank Buster's going to be pushing forward. It's going to be point defense drones on the tsunamis. They're going to be leading the charge and the tank busters stay alive. But now all of the tanks are out of range, trying to even up the damage output of these two armies. And the tank numbers getting chipped away at slowly but surely. And the one thing that Superpower didn't think about was shooting up. 
two twin blades show up and that is going to be enough to turn this army around strikers are here on the map but they were not there on the front line and the attack loses some steam gg on the south side it looks like is ready to go as well he's ready to rumble down there against fordell and it looks like he is going to be moving forward at the same time a massive soviet army in the south versus smaller armies here in the north Fordell looking to split the attention of Gigi. He's going for a massive counterattack. It's going to be an all Tangu drop in the main. Meanwhile, in the north, it's APOC tanks to the front line. Tsunamis is still trying to defend these tank busters. The bears get sniped every single time. And the tank busters have gotten so much value for this army, despite the number of assassination attempts that have been sent their way. GG and Fordell are going to have to fight their battles on their own. Strikers now going to be getting some free shots against those hammer tanks. Tangu's going to be going for the transform, looking to cut down those bullfrogs. If the bullfrogs go down, the strikers can deal with the rest of this army so exceedingly easily. And it's going to be strikers in the sky in the south, as it looks like Fordell has found an advantage, has found a weakness within GG's army. One bullfrog does not an anti-air army make, and these strikers are getting even more damage, splitting up this soviet army two more bullfrogs get jumped on get eliminated it's been enough to weaken these strikers but the strikers are still here claiming kill after kill tank after tank Meanwhile, Strikers in the north, Superpower gets another tank kill, and he puts some damage out onto those APOC tanks. It's going to take a little bit more than a couple of loose rockets to kill off those APOC tanks, but a little bit of chip damage is always nice against a Soviet player. Superpower and GG. They stepped out onto the map for basically the first time with their main armies here at like the 12-minute mark. And they didn't get a lot done, but they did keep the pressure off of their own bases for at least a moment. Fourth refinery, well, fifth refinery, not for you. The Tesla coil comes up and it gets dropped, only firing one single shot. Emperor's Rage fires off the hammer tank, shred the army of Fordell. Superpower lending his superpower of that Emperor's Rage to this Soviet army in the south. And he gets the kill. Those hammer tanks with the double guns. That was a pretty insane amount of damage output by those hammer tanks enraged with the power of the Emperor. And they were just able to slice and dice through that Empire army. APOC tanks out onto the front line. Chris sends a couple of twin blades down to the south. Terror drone gets in fact gets the infect on that uh, on that harvester. Tsunami's trying to chase away the Apox. Ah, and the Akula sub gets the kill on that naval expansion. Superpower and GG. They had kind of a slow first eight minutes of the game, but uh, they are definitely coming alive here. Double harass or even triple harass if you count that harvester. Okay, this one didn't actually go down. Chris having to lose some income. Final squadron? Maybe. Yeah, Fordell losing this refinery. That was the that was the biggest blow to the income. Oh no, it's gonna be toxin drop. Pushes back the army of Fordell. Tangus go for the transform. Just gliding over this army. Apox pushing forward, and it is going to be an all-out assault. There's the Emperor's Rage to try and get more value out of these units, but it's going to be a Soviet army crushing over top of that Empire force. If all of those tank busters had been firing the entire time, maybe something would have changed, but ultimately, Apoc tanks just have so many hit points. They just have so much health. It is hard to deal with that many APOC tanks on your front line if you don't have a good way to stop them and actually, like, hold them in place so that you can do the damage. Again, maybe if all of those tank busters had been able to be grouped up and been able to put out the damage all onto the APOC tanks, maybe it would have been different. But now the APOC tanks are in the base. GG has brought his army up. 
from the south. He's going to be going for the leech, going for the double APOC guns on these hammer tanks. And now those weakened hammer tanks, which were so low on hit points, are now finally being claimed by the Soviet player from the south. Three tanks going to be ground up and turned into mincemeat by these APOCs. MCV and, an ape and a Akula sub just kind of hanging out near each other over there on the right side of the map. This game turning into chaos. Both of the Soviet players making massive strides against their empire opponents. Satellites getting called down. War Factory takes some damage. But it's not the end of the world. Terror Drone gets sniped there. Refinery has not restarted that harvester. I did not realize GG, 90k. He's up 20k over uh, where Fordell is, 25k even. Chris as well, doing a good job of keeping that economy alive. Soviet players tend to have bigger economies or they tend to need, I should say, they tend to need more money earlier on in the game than the other factions. And of course, kind of like Zerg in StarCraft, the longer the game goes on, that can turn into a problem in the late game as the swarm mentality runs out of steam. GG now going to be getting pushed back, Emperor's Rage being turned against him, and Fordell is actually getting a win. As it turns out, when GG has to run his army all over the map and he can't keep it back at home to defend his base, it does leave a bit of an opening, it does leave a bit of a weakness. Fordell now has his own army that he has to reposition to try and get into a defensive spot. This refinery is uh, maybe going to be going down. We'll see if it survives the night, if it survives the fight. Chaos breaking out on the map. Hammer tanks from GG making their way into Fordell's base. Meanwhile, Chris is trying to crack open Superpower's base. MCV on the move here to absorb some damage and be a battering ram. And GG is just going to be turning north. I'm not sure if this is good. I think he needs to unify his army. If he unifies his army, maybe he just crushes Fordell right here, right now. But I guess at least he will be getting himself a Soviet MCV off of the land and out into the water. He'll be sending it out there. And at the same time, he will turn Chris's army away from Superpower's base. Uh, where are you going? Where are you going, Natasha? That is the bravest Natasha you have ever seen. Also, that's a dead Natasha. So bye-bye uh, to Natasha. It was nice to know you, but that is, uh, that's the end of that. GG making his way into Chris's base, forces the sell-off of that super reactor, and Fordell has chased this army from the southern edge of the map from his own main base all the way to the top right-hand corner. Superpower now going to be jumping into the middle, joining the fight on the southern half with these strikers, and he's going to be able to get a couple of free kills here. All of the anti-air from Fordell is nowhere to be seen. The tank is now moving into position. There's that refinery core from earlier. It takes so much damage, but it does survive. That refinery will live to see another day, it seems, as GG rolls over the defenses of Fordell. Satellites drop in the middle of nowhere. Toxins going to be poisoning that barracks, forcing it to be sold off. And it looks like Fordell might be able to get the Apox, but can he stop the bleeding? His base has been cracked wide open, but the Toxin drop is going to be buying some time. A perfect placement there coming in from Chris. The Toxin drop pretty much perfectly placed to push Gigi away and to harm any additional units that were coming forward by some extra time for Fordell. Uh, strikers coming in. Dreadnought? Is there a... Oh no, a couple of V4s. No Dreadnought, but a couple of V4s. And Chris may have finally done it. The Mecha Bay under threat. Superpower is going to have to pull something out pretty amazing to uh, make this one work. His MCV is going to run for it. Maybe GG can double team it for a little while. And is he, okay, I was like, if you don't magnetic harpoon the MCV, then it's kind of your fault for letting it escape. And the MCV will be ground down to dust 
and I don't think there is a naval yard out on the map for Superpower. So Superpower is hoping that he can make his mark in this game and, uh, well, hoping that he can survive his own base, perhaps, as the APOC tanks go for it. And this is not something we see very often. APOC tanks grinding each other down in massive numbers. GG going for the roar with the bears. He's going for the kill of those tank busters. But ultimately, it is Chris's APOX that reigns supreme. And it is Chris's forces that will find the kill there. Oh my gosh, Chris still hasn't been able to deal with these Tangus. From moments ago, Chris, or from like a minute or two ago, Chris has not been able to kill off these Tangus. And uh, well, he maybe lost his MCV, but I don't think he'll lose the game because of it. It will buy a lot of time for Superpower, who has three refineries up and running. Both of the Empire players taking a bit of a beating. Is he gonna get it? Oh my gosh, he might just go for it. And there we go. He gets the super reactor. He won't necessarily get much else for it. Oh, if he gets the tier three as well. Again, it doesn't it doesn't change necessarily the whole state of the game. It is an it is a nice kill though. If he gets that tier three and he gets the super reactor. Oh my gosh, super power with the with the like golden boy Tangu army. This is the Super Tangu army. Three full heroic Tangus, one double vet, one single vet. They have got a massive amount of experience between them. And the Iron Curtain, which I didn't even recognize. I didn't even remember was there. Iron Curtain on five APOC tanks as they descend upon that mecha bay. And there is nothing that this Empire player can do. This is not how you want to see yourself go down. But you can't stop the APOX. And they're going to get themselves an MCV. A tasty, tasty MCV as Chris's army crosses down from the north looking to support what little Fordell has left. MCV goes down. Refinery might be going down. No, the MCV escapes. Are you kidding me? The Terror Drone gets the shutdown on that APOC and Fordell keeps his MCV alive. I thought GG had it. No, are you kidding me? Oh, GG. I am sorry for you, man. <laughs> that MCV was as good as dead. And, Su and uh, Fordell and Chris save it. Oh, man. All right, Superpower going for the goofball moments. Superpower hoping that uh, his harvesters will win the day. And who knows, maybe they will. War Factory getting targeted? Uh, did, did Chris, did Chris rebuild? Does Chris have an MCV? Is Chris dead? Is this Fordell versus Gigi? Uh, Chris might be dead. What you see is what you get with Chris. That might just kind of be it. Gigi has found the back door attack. Chris also has a Kirov out on the map. I'm not sure when he got that, but yeah. Chris, if he loses these buildings, then he's just out. He's got two refineries, and I think he's got no safety and no backup buildings, so he may actually just need to leave the game. Otherwise, this entire army is going to explode. It's just Harvester's attacking that refinery. Kirov is going for the kill on that, on that refinery. And Fordell, I mean, yeah, his MCV did survive. He got his Mecha Bay back up and running, but... This is actually going to be it for Chris. Chris, leave the game, man. Leave the game. Bullfrog's moving into position. They're going to get themselves a twin blade, maybe two twin blades. And as long as one refinery survives, they've still got two sets of hands. One flak trooper is not quite enough, but it is going to be the point defense drones that pop on the defense for these Soviet units. Tangus shred those twin blades. And okay, Chris gets to stick around in this game.
Oh my gosh, that one harvest, that one refinery with like 10% HP is the thing that is keeping Chris in this game. And again, if Chris dies, uh, his units explode. But if he leaves the game, then he gets to hand over everything to Fordow. Harvester's getting gunned down. That was the attempt at the heroic Harvester charge. It, uh, it doesn't always work. Okay, well, Emperor's Rage fires off. I actually, I don't know who did that because it wasn't on all of the APOC tanks. No, it was on all of the APOC tanks. I thought it only got one of the APOC tanks. I was like, oh, that was kind of a badly placed Emperor's Rage, but it wasn't. GG is making his last stand. Superpower sending out random units to seemingly every corner of the map just to try and cause chaos. I don't know that it's really going to be working. Or Refinery. Sheesh, down to like 10% HP. And Chris is still in this game. Technically, Chris does still have income. So, I mean, he could get another Harvester online and keep harvesting. Uh, not that there's a, an advantage to that, but technically, these are things that could happen. Two very low health APOC tanks here from Chris. Once again, the Twin Blades get shredded by those Tangus. Iron Curtain fires off. It was ready to go once again. And it looks like GG is going to be making another play for the front line. He's going to be spending a lot of time of this Iron Curtain just making his way to his opponent's base. So it's not necessarily going to be a huge amount of damage output, but it will be enough to take down this Mecha Bay. I don't think there's a way to stop these APOC tanks from this point. That's another tier two Mecha Bay. Oh, if he magnetic harpoons these units, he might be able to grind them down. I think he would, oh, that's a fully, oh, two fully heroic uh, Apox. I'm not sure where that goes. And Fordell has been defeated. Chris has been defeated. GG was the only player with like an active anything in that game. And that will decide it. GG comes through with the big Soviet energy and will win the game for his team. That was a pretty crazy 2v2. I am glad that someone sent that over to me, despite the fact that it's like seven years old when they sent it to me. And that was a super fun 2v2. Welcome to Burnt Out Paradise for a six player FFA. A free for all and we have got, well, not a lot of variety in the faction choice, but in the North playing the yellow, this is Egyptian Rusher is going to be playing allies. Let's scroll over here to the green Soviets, the only Soviet player in this match. This is Rick 09. We'll scroll on over to the left side of the map and check out our red Empire player. This is Pantro. Man, when you guys see his name, I don't know how to pronounce that name. As the purple allies, this is fix and oh, as the cyan allies this is barat and meanwhile in the south playing the orange empire this is voto canal all right we have got six players we have got ourselves a fancy new UI and overlay. It is indeed an FFA. We have got an FFA with three allied players, two empire players, and one Soviet player. So, and also a new UI courtesy of Drive, new animations and features courtesy of Double Evil. But uh, it's, it makes me so happy because I can just do that and I press one button and yeah, the timing doesn't line up exactly, but the fact is it just, it works the way that I always wanted it to. I don't have to do some weird stuff uh, inside of OBS. It just, it works so nicely. But again, these are, these are all of these changes that make a difference to me, but don't really make a difference to you guys. Wow, that's a fast observation post. You have to give it to Pantro for the fast observation post capture and garage capture which there are a lot of garages on this map. I think there's six garages. Uh, yeah, that's two in the middle. There's one over there. I feel like there's one more. I feel like there's one more. There's one there. 
and one there oh there's two on the same side of the map yeah so there's six garages on this map keep that in mind as this game goes on the ground armies are going to have some very powerful repairs that might end up getting depleted as the game goes on since this is an ffa you don't have any kind of team repair shenanigans going on everyone has to manage their own garage and then we do have uh oil derricks dry docks hospitals that kind of thing but anyways, we've got a six-player FFA. We've got three allies, one Soviet, and two empires, which kind of, you know, helps make up for the fact that the last uh, subscriber replay stream, we had like a five Soviet, one allied 2v2v2. So we're kind of, you know, when it's not quite the reverse, but we're getting a little bit more allied representation here in these big games. And Burnt Out Paradise, it's a map that we don't see very often. I'm always glad to see this map. Uh, looks like Pantro's got a third refinery, a fourth refinery coming up, but a little bit of a delay there. Very passive openings for all of these players. Very cautious, maybe, as we head into the mid game. Four refineries pretty quickly here by Egyptian Rusher. Third refinery up and running. Fourth refinery even for Barat couple of names that I recognize from some previous games. Third refinery is maybe a little bit slow here for Rick. So Rick maybe not quite as fast on those refineries as some other players. Defender core and Tangus going to be enough anti-air for just this one airfield worth of units. Barracks in the corner. Ooh, trying to sneak something out. Barat is going for the corner expansion. Could even be going for a naval yard down in that position and hoping that it doesn't get noticed for a couple of minutes. Although there are some Yari mini subs nearby. Meanwhile, Egyptian Rusher, he's looking to take both of the corner positions. And oh, that multi-gunner turret got a lot of damage out onto that refinery core, which was trying to expand to the water and is now realizing that these high ground expansions might be some of the only things left on the map. Oh no, double evil, you are correct. I have completely forgotten to add the game timer to this scene in uh in obs it is five minutes and ten seconds though i can see it you guys can't but yes uh that's a good point i completely forgot about that that is one of those things see this is why we do testing this is why we do stress testing engineer gets sniped pantro pantro is not having a good day loses an engineer loses a refinery core as well so that's 2500 credits down the drain but he might be able to make up for it if he is going for a fast Eureka. We'll see where that ends up taking him. A couple of jabs going to be getting jumped on. These Tangus will be getting cleaned up, but that's probably more than enough jab kills to make up for the two Tangus that went down. Maybe it was three Tangus. Maybe that just kind of evens things out. Another refinery core heading out. And yeah, these high ground expansions are uh, some of the few that remain unclaimed by anyone. The, uh, all of the rest of the land expansions have pretty much been taken, and this corner water expansion is one of the few remaining naval expansions that haven't been claimed yet. So a lot of fast refinery takes by all of these folks. Garage gets grabbed, which is a backup garage for Barat, and also takes away the garage from Vodokanal. Eureka is out on the map always glad to see Eureka running around and if there's a if there's a time to go for a Eureka rush taking a chance on an FFA that's a fine place to do it you know maybe not not in the grand finals of a tournament maybe that's not the place to try it out for the first time but maybe in an FFA like just go for it and now the Imperial Docks goes up to tier two I'm not sure what she's waiting for outside Oh, nice jump by that dolphin. Egyptian Rusher gets the dodge on those Vindicator Bombs and goes for the jump with the dolphin. The Apollo's just waiting, ready to go. Guardian tanks still getting repaired. Those Tangus thinking that they were winning the day by killing that garage, but it really didn't matter. Purple Fix. I feel like Fix has got a good opportunity to just build up, you know, quietly no one's really paying any attention to him Ooh, mecha bay gets sold off a big problem there for voto canal he does still have the naval yard out on the water but it does not bode well for you when you've got guardian tanks inside of your base even if you crush one of them 
if you lose your mecha bay, if you lose your economy and your MCB is just running for the hills, it does not bode well. So Vodo Canal, he might be getting knocked out, but maybe he'll do the FFA thing where you don't quite get knocked out. You get beaten down close to knocked out and then you just sort of survive for a while in the background. And I just realized that we lost we lost sight of Eureka, which means she could be in a sudden transport somewhere, making her way around the map. But I'm just not seeing a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for that. Rick Nine also has a bit of an opportunity to be a sleeper agent here. He's got his three refineries, but Egyptian Rusher has not turned on him. Egyptian Rusher is hoping to just build up big time in the north of the map. Egyptian Rusher barely leading the economy graph by only 2,000 credits total resources gathered ahead of Barat. So he's at 50k Egyptian Rusher, that is, as we cross the uh, 8 minute 40 second mark. And Barat, he's at, you know, 48,000 roughly at the same time. Big naval presence here, and that MCV just suddenly realizes, uh-oh, I am not safe out on the water. That MCV heads back for home. Nagantana out on the map. Now, you might be saying, hey, isn't that Naganata? And I say, no, it's like they strapped a katana to the front of the ship, and they just use that to impale their opponents. Naganatana goes down to the depths with that. It's not a great strategy. Strapping a sword to the front of a boat is uh, is not a great strategy. All right. I feel like Egyptian Rusher and Barat are emerging as our big players to pay attention to. But Red, Red is honestly in third place in terms of economy. However, he is 14,000 credits behind where Barat is. So being in third place, it's sort of like first place and second place are neck and neck. They're quite close to each other. And then third place is, uh, you know, 25% behind that. Something like that. Nail the yard under threat. Voto Canal may be able to escape if his MCV is, you know, somewhere heading for the edge, but he is functionally out of this game. An Egyptian rusher can go ahead and, uh, well, not Egyptian rusher. Barat can go ahead and expand to this location. Three refineries potentially here for the taking and our first player to be defeated just over there defeated and yeah egyptian rusher and brett they're definitely going to be the big two powerhouse players however fix and pantro both have an opportunity to you know be sleeper agents here fix has not the biggest economy but it's big enough that he's got, you know, and he hasn't had to fight anyone up to this point, but he's got all of the late game tools. He's got cryocopters, he's got Athena cannons, he's got sentry bombers. He can potentially do something here. I do worry that picking a fight with Barat after Barat just killed Voto Canal is uh, maybe not the best move. We'll see if it works out for him because Egyptian Rusher might be taking the heat off of purple. This might be where Cyan and Yellow fight to the death and then green, red, and purple, they just kind of wait quietly for a victor to emerge. Maybe we'll see an unholy alliance as they gang up on the others, as some folks gang up on others. Uh, that was a random sickle. Nothing really going on there. Just one sickle made it so deep into enemy territory. Cryocopter's going for the freeze, but not a great strategy there from Fix. He is definitely going to need someone to help him fix his base. Okay, we had to we had to do it at least once. Egyptian Rusher, he's got the big navy. He's got the big army. He's working on land. He's working on sea. And he's got a couple of aircraft carriers as well. At least three of them making their way along the side. Engineer gets sniped. And Barat is going to have to contend with Egyptian Rusher sooner or later. It's going to be uh, a potentially big fight if Barat is just focused on land and Egyptian Rusher is focused more on Navy. They might have a bit of a mismatch there. War Factory survives. So Fix is still in this. Fix also still has the garage. So free repairs there anywhere on the battlefield. And the aircraft carriers have made their way. Uh, one of them is going to get tagged by a cryoblast here. And it does indeed freeze, but there isn't much nearby. We'll see if a Vindicator swoops in. 
Uh, Brat not able to do anything about it. Dolphins trying to come in. And the aircraft carrier might as well thaw out now. We'll see if he actually gets to thaw. Cryocopters are here. This is a lot of dolphins from Egyptian Russia. And the aircraft carrier unfreezes. It thaws out. And, uh, well, Egyptian Russia might have two things to worry about. Rick09, who's got himself an Athena hammer tank, which is always amazing to see. This is enough hammers to deal with the mirages, but the mirages don't go down easy when they're up against just leech beams. It does take a little while to actually steal those weapons. And now the hammer tanks can actually turn their guns on this ground army. Egyptian rusher, he may be fighting two enemies at once. It looks like Barat's going for mass dolphins. I think it used to be more mass dolphins, but they've been significantly less massed those dolphins in the last minute or two they've been cut down a bit by egyptian rusher's forces and egyptian rusher doesn't have much on land he's got in a war factory he's got some mirage tanks but he spent so much of his 99,000 credits on his naval forces that he doesn't have a whole lot on land to really deal with this army However, EMP is a pretty good move. Mirage Tank will eventually get sniped, and the tanks come back online. Twin Blades as well going to be getting in on the action and helping to deal with that base. Well, bye-bye Egyptian Rusher's land army has been defeated, and his land base has been knocked down by Rick. The sleeper Soviet with only three refineries and I think no garage. He hasn't even captured his garage. He's got this massive tank land army and he doesn't actually have a garage to help support it, which Soviets need the garage more than anyone else. Satellites come down. One hydrofoil sneaks out of that nail yard. Egyptian rusher has other production facilities elsewhere on the map, so he's going to be doing all right. The Athena, the Athena Hammer Tank is priority. In my opinion, that is one of the greatest units in the game. I'm not saying it's practical. I'm saying I like seeing it. It's super fun, and, uh, you know, I would, I would prioritize it. I wouldn't win the game, though. So, yeah, maybe prioritize it isn't the right choice, but it's the fun choice. You might lose the game, but you'll lose in style. Apollos are here to defend Barat, now facing the terror of an FFA where he's fighting yellow, purple, and red, all within about 30 seconds of each other. He's going to be losing a harvester over there, maybe losing a power plant up there. An Egyptian rusher has turned his sights on to Rick. His navy has fully retreated from the southern half of the map, and he is looking to end Green's whole career, to knock down the refinery, knock down the war factory, and knock down everything else as well. Hey, there's your battle bunker. We'll even, we'll even clear the screen for you. There you go. Some people on YouTube really like the battle bunker. They want it to be in basically every game. And that one is for them. They got their battle bunker this time. That's a lot of shoguns. That's a lot of shoguns there on the left side of the map. Egyptian rusher bringing the pain. Sentry bombers. <laughs> he goes for the barracks. He doesn't actually get it. As it turns out, it takes more than one sentry bomber to kill a barracks. I mean, if all of the bombs landed... Uh, where are you going? If all the bombs landed on the barracks, then it'd be easy. But they don't. So it doesn't really work. Laser lock on the refinery. Fully heroic Jeff can indeed kill a refinery with laser lock. And then he's going to die to the conscript. And uh, even, the, even the flak troopers over there. Bears, flak troopers, and a couple of engineers getting dropped into a cryo shot. And they get insta-frozen there. Two of the bears survive, two of the flak troopers as well. None of the engineers, the safety cryo shot fires off and the mass dolphin army from Barat in the south finds a couple more marks. Apollo's cleaning up a couple of vindicators, Barat having to fight on multiple fronts and he's making it work, albeit barely. He is, he's holding together, but that massive economy aided by the three additional refineries here in the original position of Voto Canal. That's one of those things that uh, helps a lot, having an economy that's like double the size of everyone else. 
Couple of tank busters coming in. Old tank buster surprise being activated there by Pantro. And uh, looks like he might be defeated by one dog. Okay, no, two dogs and they go underground. Egyptian Rusher has is back in the driver's seat. He is ready to go once again. And this is just a massive army here from Barat. He is crushing through everything. And he is, he's gonna just kill off this entire purple player. Fix might survive out on the water. Maybe, maybe not. We will see about that. But uh, it's not gonna be pretty. It's gonna be a tough one for Fix. We'll see if he's actually able to uh, to survive, you know. Again, he could be a sleeper agent. He could be defeated on land, but still alive out at sea. He's got the oiled Eric as well, so he's always got that opportunity. Rick has been defeated, so our second player out of the game. And then there were four. Barat going to be selling off that refinery. And once again, Egyptian Rusher and Barat, they are the big two powerhouse players. But... Let's not turn our back on Pantro, who is, you know, down 50k in total resources gathered compared to the other guys, but it is a powerful empire army, and the 50k doesn't matter if it's been destroyed fighting another giant army. Those are the things that, you know, sometimes just don't matter. The dolphin charge is coming in. And will they actually engage? They might actually go for the kill, go for the attack against Egyptian Rusher. The original main base of Barat may have to be evacuated. Cryogeddon is going to try and catch a couple of these aircraft carriers. It looks like nothing will be caught, but no, one Hydrofoil does get found by that. And Rick has been defeated, but Fix is still in this game. I feel like Fix is on the edge of leaving, but he's still holding out hope with that naval base over here he's just hoping he's got his mcv he's got his naval yard he's got his economy his one refinery plus the oil derrick that's all you need hey, he's got a garage as well that's that's nice egyptian rusher is gonna have another ground army to deal with and here's the charge of the dolphins they are riding into battle as they surround or they go for the kill on these aircraft carriers not quite going for a surround but that is going to be two dead aircraft carriers. Cryoblast fires off. Hydrofoil gets instantly frozen by just this, by this symphony of cryocopters. That Hydrofoil just instantly locked down. No hope for that guy. A lot of Tangus coming out. Cryocopters making their way around somewhere else. Dolphin emerges. Gets the kill on that hydrofoil. I have no idea what happened to Eureka. I don't know that Eureka ever did anything. Maybe she just died off. Died off screen and we just never even saw it. This is slowly becoming Barat has the entire bottom half of the map. Which, by the way, Barat is about to cross the 200k resources gathered mark. He's, uh, he's at plus 12 average for the last couple of minutes. So his income is almost doubling the other players. His active income is almost doubling the other players in this game. Tangus fly over the army. A couple of Tangus going to be going down. Unfortunately, their honorable discharge does not drop them directly onto Barat's army. This would be an amazing cryogeddon location. Uh, they might still escape, but it would be an absolute madhouse to try and get out. Oh, I was kind of hoping that was going to be a Tanya drop. And oh, hey, look at that. We have our first super weapon out on the map. It is from a player who I don't think is necessarily going to be long for this world. I don't have a lot of confidence that Pantro is going to be around in six minutes to be able to uh, hold this off. This is a lot. This is a lot of artillery. Just giant sections of the screen turning to pure white. As the Tangus descend upon this army, Aegis Shield is nice, but it is not the end all be all. King Oni's coming down from the high ground. They go for the bull rush, but they've all been shrunk down, and the strikers are here. But you need something on the ground to contest this army of Barat. 
It is not enough to have a couple of strikers trying to kill cryocopters. And after all that, it looks like our super weapon may indeed fall by the wayside. And yep, that's going to be the fire sail. Uh, interestingly, he doesn't fire sail the psychic dominator. That is sort of the one thing that he didn't fire sail. All right, Barat turns away, but that is now two players that Barat has almost killed and not killed. And at this point, Egyptian Rusher is about 50,000 credits down in total resources gathered compared to Barat. So it's really Barat's game to lose here, but it is definitely still possible for him to lose. I think at this point it requires an unholy alliance. It requires the three other members to join together. Well, this is not a good start. Shogun battleships, a cryo get in from another player, and then dolphins closing in. It is not a good combination. Although for the current moment, if the dolphins and the shoguns fight each other, maybe this MCV will be able to escape. Fix does have 3.5k in the bank, so there is a possibility of escape. All right, not so much if the cryocopters start targeting this MCV, and uh, it will die. All right, Fix has been defeated, and then there were three. But I mean, it does feel like there are two. Shogun battleships, they are powerful. We don't want to count Pantro out just yet but it is, a, uh, it is a tough spot that he is in. A difficult place to come back to, pa back from at this point in the game. But, you know, it's always, it always, it's always possible. Yeah, he's got that naval yard. He's got an oil derrick. So there is, there is always hope for Pantro. He is technically never out of this game until he is out of the game. Although I think you also probably could suicide on his one building and end the game just like that. Uh, we'll see. The dolphins are coming in. This might turn into a bit of a mess as the water effects go crazy. The dolphins coming through. The cryocopters paying the price for it all. And well, that is going to be dead cryocopters, dead shoguns, dead dolphins, but also a dead empire player. Goodbye to Pantro. Wow, I timed that almost perfectly. Wouldn't that have been amazing <laughs> if I said it just perfectly? And then there were two. So now we've got uh, we've got Pantro out. It's Egyptian Rusher, and it's Barat. It always was going to be you. I mean, these two guys started the game with the biggest economies of anyone and uh no one was able to gang up on them double war factory love to see a double war factory in red alert 3 it doesn't happen very often it happens very very rarely in 1v1s it happens a bit more in team games but even so just the way the red alert 3 economy works is this gonna be a, a swaparoo but instead of like a base trade this is like a land for sea trade egyptian russia is going to dominate in the ocean and Barat is going to dominate on land. That, that could be. We'll see. Barat's economy has just sort of been out of control this game. 266k. He's like 70 grand over Egyptian Rusher. And, uh, well, it looks like he's going to be able to survive on the sea. And he's going to be able to dominate on land. So I think that will do it for this one. Egyptian Rusher had an opportunity there, you know, if he could have coordinated in the all chat. It definitely would have been an unholy alliance. <laughs> this is like one cryocopter for every land unit that Egyptian Rusher has. And Egyptian Rusher isn't giving up. He's not giving up and he's getting in the holiday spirit with a donation of five hydrofoils to those dolphins. And it looks like that will be it for the game. Barat takes the win, and that will finish out that match. A six-player FFA. Always fun to get an FFA in the mix. But that one, turns out the writing was on the wall, and the writing was correct pretty much from the very beginning. 
Welcome to Carville for a 2v2v2. Spawning as the green allies in the middle. This is GGOT. I hope they're an ally. Oh, uh oh, where are these spawns? Is this a double? Oh, this is a middle. This is an island versus the world game. So playing as the green Soviets, this is Silver Surfer. Playing as the Orange Empire, this is War Server. The Red Soviets to the south, this is Quirfry. Like QWERTY. Q-W-E-R-T-Y, the keyboard layout, but we're free. And playing as the blue allies, this is Zorminator. Their teammate to the left in the corner, playing as the Soviets, it is Yannick. Earlier on in the stream, we had a FFA that was three allied players, two empire players, and one Soviet player. And now we have three Soviet players, two allied player, and one empire player. It's uh, sort of all evening out here. We're just, we're making everything as equal as it can be between these days. I do love the drafting a couple of power plants in your allies base, you know, keeps your base nice and slim and trim. This is also a cryo rush. I didn't even realize green going for a cryo rush. GGOT going for the insta kill. Oh, early bomb there. You got to wait a moment for it to actually uh, be frozen. And the Tagus are going to get the jump on that cryocopter. They get the snipe on the cryocopter, but of course the Harvester has already gone down. They get the Vindicator as well, but the Harvester hasn't been restarted. Quirfree is very low on cash, sells off the War Factory to afford the Harvester. Probably could have sold off those power plants up there and the barracks, but I wasn't actually paying attention to how much cash he had at the very beginning of that. But wow, Quirfree was completely out of cash. And GGOT, on the other hand, he had to dump a bunch of money into that cryo rush, but he's probably pretty happy with that first result uh, even if that isn't his most relevant opponent. When you're a double middle team like this, you can very easily end up in a situation where you're fighting the enemies on both sides of you. There is no reprieve. There is no escape. And you are just for... Is this MCV going to get infected? Oh my gosh. Reactor starts. Blue infect the MCV. Blue! Blue, no! Oh, he gets it. Okay, he sees it. Uh, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Don't, don't stop. Just infect it. Okay, there we go. MCV gets infected. Uh, Mecha Bay is all the way back there. I think the MCV has enough health to make it all the way back there. This is one of those things that doesn't come up very often. What is the kill rate of a Terror Drone and in an MCV from full health? I should time that out. Like, how long does it take? And then, uh, how, how far can the MCV travel in that amount of time? It looks like the MCV will be fine. They have a ton of health. And, I mean, technically, War Server does have cash in the bank. He's got income. He's got enough income that he could build another MCV and, uh, and be fine. But, obviously, this is a huge delay to what War Server was trying to do. It's not the end of the world. Because he got that barracks, because Quirfree got that reactor... Quirfree can't actually expand up there, and War Server got both of those oil derricks, so that actually works out not good. Obviously, getting an MCV infected by a terror drone is a pretty bad thing to have happen, but it works out all right. It is definitely not as bad as it could be. Meanwhile, Yannick is going to be expanding up to the top left, so there is going to be a red versus blue battle in the top left-hand corner. At least that's what we can hope could be that uh, red versus blue never actually fight. Occasionally you will see that that corner of the map just gets sort of peaceably divided and for like 20 minutes, no one is really attacking each other. Two different teams are harvesting from each of those sets of ore nodes, but the fighting is happening elsewhere on the map. One Soviet, one allied refinery there on the water, a delightful split of essentially all of the natural resources on this center island by these two players and this is going to be the long distance mining for this refinery hasn't quite paid for itself just yet 
MCV getting some free, free repairs there at that mecha bay. A couple of Tangus might be going down. They're desperate to transform, but they're not going to be able to do it safely. Striker will chase away those Apollos. And the MCV continues to heal up. Engineer gets the capture on that refinery. You love to see the engineer capture of a refinery. Always fun when you get to steal something away from your opponent like that, which is indeed a bounty in Chronosphere, or in Chrono Clash. Whoever gets the essentially the highest value engineer capture of their of an opponent building, not counting oil derricks. Uh, gets gets a little cash bounty, a little fun little reward in the upcoming Chrono Clash tournament. Harvester, uh, not harvesters. <laughs> Naval Yard going to be going down, and one Riptide will be eliminated by that Akula Subs Ultra Torpedoes. But this is definitely one of those matches where it's feeling pretty active and even from all of these players. There is, uh, you know, maybe a standout. Quirk Free is definitely low in income, only at 12k total resources gathered compared to everyone else. But Quirk Free is now going to have three refineries out on the map with that corner expansion. Still hasn't taken this main base refinery at all. Quirk Free is not going to be uh, going to be doing much harvesting there. And gets the Sputnik. So going for a fourth refinery out just out in the world rather than the second refinery in his own main base airfield does go down but the apollos and the vindicators will get the kill on the strikers as they try to survive and natasha out on the map maybe some snipes will be coming up there for old natasha sniping some uh, aircraft carriers tesla coil oh tesla coil gets the kill all right good to see that tesla coil actually managing to do something that is indeed just a random conscript running around. For a second, I thought it might be a spy or something from one of the allied players, but... No, it's not a spy. Vindicator's making another bombing run, this time against Natasha. Low power mode there for Silver Surfer. Cryocopter is going to be able to get the freeze on these strikers. No Vindicator nearby, it seems. Aha! Vindicator's coming in. They will be able to clean up all of those strikers. Nice bomb splitting from GGOT. Uh, what? Not, might not have enough time to do anything else. Striker will be able to get some good, uh, good shots off against one of those cryocopters, but not enough to actually end the cryocopter. And that's going to be a cryo shot plus two cryocopters to get the freeze on this mecha bay. And that Vindicator has enough health. Forces the sell off of that mecha bay. Gets the kill on the striker as well. And Akirov! Akirov from Team Green Silver Surfer bringing the Soviet power supreme to the edge of the map. One Apollo is not going to be enough to shut down Akirov, especially when you got two MiGs on standby. And now Team Blue, who has had such a good, easy opening, Yannick and Zorminator have been facing very little opposition for these first couple of minutes now have to deal with a Kirov in their base and this won't be the end of the game for them but a little bit of damage is nice to be done MiGs get absolutely shredded and it looks like this Kirov might get one more power plant and that will pretty much be it war server goes for the attack in the middle of the map we saw those uh, tsunami tanks looking for a kill but they just weren't able to get very much done. And now Zorminator has multiple aircraft carriers right there on the edge. And the snipe probably will come through for Natasha. Uh, might be able to snipe. Nope. I thought she was going to maybe be able to get one of the aircraft carriers. But she just gets annihilated by those dolphins before she ever has a chance to uh, get the kill on that aircraft carrier. And V4s, I guess, can eat up some of those dolphins, but they're not going to be long for this world as the aircraft carriers make short work of those V4s. Counterattack is just not quite enough. Meanwhile, Team Blue making their way to Red's expansion. 
And, uh, well, that is going to be it for War Server and Quirfree. Team Red just annihilated there all in one go. And now it's Team Blue versus Team Green. And, uh, well, let's just say Team Blue has a bit of an advantage and it's going to be pretty tough for Team Green to turn that around, but maybe maybe they can. They're only 20, 25,000 credits down in total resources gathered. So that is possible to... Oh, messed up the, messed up the freezing, uh, the bombing order a little bit there. But good bomb splitting from Team Green. I'm so bad at bomb splitting that I always appreciate when players are able to do it well. Hydrofoil will get a little bit of damage out onto those cryocopters, but not very much. And uh, I don't know why there aren't like 10 Apollos moving in. Okay, it's because there's a couple of bullfrogs moving in. Bullfrogs are pretty good there, so they will be able to get the kill on a couple of those units and force away that allied air armada. Four cryocopters do manage to escape. And for the current moment, no super power, super weapons anywhere on the map. Terror drones escaping out to the water where the Tesla troopers cannot swim. And two aircraft carriers going to be trying their best to hit those, those infantry, but they just can't do it. Not quite able to do it. Four cryocopters, another Natasha snipe. These dolphins are so good at sniping Natasha. All right, Team Green. Do we believe in Team Green? They've got the power of cryocopters on their side. Migs now swinging in. Yannick decides, I've had enough of your sneaky allied air tactics. Although these Apollos are gonna get maybe two kills on these Migs. Sh shut down some of those Mig numbers. And the Apollos don't give chase. They might have been able to tag one more of those of those MiGs as they were landing. But, you know, not a guarantee there. You never know what's waiting for you in the fog of war. Aircraft carriers making their way along the north side of the map. They're not really trying to contend down here. I feel like maybe the Akula Sups plus the aircraft carriers could crack open this bottom right corner of the water. And then maybe they could make their way around the map and start doing some more damage to blue. Uh, Akula Sups... Three out of the four do get tagged by that EMP. Fortunately for green, there isn't a ton of damage output here in this area. And it looks like the aircraft carriers, two of them are going north, two of them are going south, and a dreadnought is joining the fight as well. Ultra, ultra torpedoes absorbed by that aircraft carrier, but uh, the aircraft carriers will be able to win this fight as long as they can land those shots. And it looks like that Akula sub is not long for this world. Bye-bye, Akula, as he will get eliminated. Ultra torpedoes being absorbed by these aircraft carriers and the double naval yard is, uh, that's a lot of production. But Team Green, they're finally bringing their guns to bear down there in the south. War Server and Quir Free got eliminated, but this might actually be a pretty long 2v2 now that the map has kind of opened up. There is still a pretty big income advantage for Yannick and Zorminator. They have had that income advantage essentially all game long. So it's up to Team Green to really make the moves and do some damage. Start putting the hurt on Team Blue, which maybe they're gonna be able to do. Black Hole Armor absorbing a couple of the those aircraft carrier drone bombs. Twin Blade's going to be showing up. Yannick always happy to bring along a couple of twin blades to a fight. EMP locks down and EMP return fire. <laughs> and it will be like five out of the six active aircraft carriers in this section of the map do get knocked down. One dolphin heroically going to town on this aircraft carrier and he's gonna get the kill too with the help of another aircraft carrier. And I think the dolphin didn't get any of the credit for that kill. This Kirov is still active from Yannick in the middle of the map, and eventually it will go down to those bullfrogs. It did some damage. It cut a little path through this expansion. And, uh, okay, Dreadnought out here on the water from Team Blue gets sniped by the Athena Can, and that Athena Can and dodging shots, and then also managing to get the kill on the Harvester, on the Dreadnought and we'll get the kill on the refinery as well. One more blast from that Athena Cannon, and we'll get that kill. 
goes heroic and then maybe <laughs> immediately gets sniped by these twin blades too bad for you athena cannons Aegis Shield does pop. Team Green making some headway here in the bottom right-hand corner of the ocean is going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Team Blue. That is a swimming javelin soldier, which is not something you see very often. I mean, of course, that was a spy from Team Blue, from Zorminator. Ultra Torpedoes firing off. Only one aircraft carrier is left. Team Green, they are making some good plays. They are uh, they are still down in total resources, gathered about 40,000 credits between the two of them. And they are extremely low on cash as well, drawing zeros in their bank accounts, overextended on power, unfortunately, for GGOT. And uh, he's just, he's got that chronosphere, but it's low power mode. He needs to get that back online, get that Proton Collider working as well. Tesla Coil gets basically insta-sniped. As soon as it gets born, it gets eliminated. Akula subs will get frozen in place, so no more damage from those Akulas. Cryogeddon fires off, catches one of the Akulas. The other two manage to escape. And, well, escape may not be for long because this... Uh, not quite two shots. There we go. Three shots to kill two Akula subs. Pretty good for that Assault Destroyer. Satellite drops in. Both of these naval yards are low on health, but they are still here. And it looks like GGOT has made good progress in with his Navy, but hasn't quite won the day just yet. Ah, Natasha coming in for the snipe. Silver Surfer might be able to get the kill on this, uh, on this Assault Destroyer quite easily. Vindicators come in. Natasha getting bombed, and the dolphin going for another snipe. It never fails. Natasha just constantly getting sniped by dolphins in this game. And that is a fully heroic Athena cannon sniping that refinery from so, so far away. Chronosphere is ready to go, just like the Chrono Clash, as it gets utilized somewhere out on the map. I don't actually know where it was used. Where's that APOC tank going? He needs to get himself some repairs. I'm not sure what his destination is. Crusher Crane is all the way over there. He turned around somewhat errantly. Iron Curtain out on the map. Vacuum Imploder finishing up as well for Yannick. So we now have two sets of super weapons out on the map, courtesy of, uh, you know, two of our biggest income guys. Man, Zorminator has 100k total resources gathered. Yannick, 140k almost. Meanwhile, GGOT and Silver Surfer, they're doing well, but not that well. Migs catch a bunch of Apollos cutting down the air forces of GGOT. GGOT still has those cryocopters and you have to have it to Yannick. You have to hand it to Yannick and Zorminator. They have been doing a good job of pretty much constantly expanding. They are going to encircle the center of the map, surround them, and then push in with an infinite number of twin blades, it seems, and go for the kill. Twin blades swinging in, flak cannon getting built, but it's a little bit late to the party. Proton Collider could take some chip damage. Sputnik on the low ground for Silver Surfer. Mix coming in. Twin blades going for the kill on the power plant, trying to delay these super weapons as long as they can. Three minutes on the clock for that Proton Collider. And uh, it's low power mode once again for GGOT. He's been struggling with that power, and he is extremely low on income. So he's been, it's been a tough game for GGOT's electricity, electrical grid. Dreadnought goes down. Aircraft carrier goes down. Zorminator finally bringing the cryo power of allies to the water and getting some big kills on those naval artillery. Another cryocopter or two going down. GGOT making some mistakes, losing some units, and paying the price for it. 
Oh wow, GGOT is pretty massively overextended. Over 200 power under the limit. He's going to need three power plants to come back online, which when you have zero dollars and only 4.4k of income, uh, 2.2k over, uh, over the course of a minute, it's basically a whole minute of just building power plants and then your bank, bank account is still at zero. Natasha just flying into the middle of the map. Can't get the snipe. Go for the snipe. Gets the snipe on the Athena cannon. That's a fully heroic Athena that, uh, wow. Okay. You want to kill Natasha? That is one way to do it. Peacekeeper waits an appropriate amount of time and then gets the snipe on Natasha. Not a good game to be Natasha. A lot of dead Natashas in this one. And the MiGs are going to fall. And the jabs split. <laughs> they dodge away from the falling MiG. Unfortunately for Silver Surfer, he wasn't able to get that extra bit of damage. I have to say, the green team has done a really good job of surviving and existing and fighting back. They are uh, quite literally surrounded. It is almost a full 360 degrees of blue around this island. Bye bye, Twin Blade. And blue has, has done a lot, but they just have not been able to close it out. Satellites dropping in once again. Seaport goes down, EMP lands. And now a fully heroic Akula sub. Oh, gets EMP'd by his own team. The Akula sub now taking splash damage from that aircraft carrier. Takes a shot from a Tesla coil and no, he's gonna die. The fully heroic Akula sub dies to a Tesla coil. The fate of death, not the way you want it. Iron Curtain is ready. Minute and a half until the vacuum imploder. Two minutes until the proton collider. And only 15 seconds until the chronosphere. Double terror drone, in fact, on those Akula subs. Slowly but surely going to be tearing them apart from the inside out. And Blue has been building up massive income all game long, and they're finally bringing it to bear, maybe all at once. Chronosphere fires off. I don't know where it went. He chronosphered something somewhere, but I don't see where it could have been. Stingray clears out those terror drones, and the Dreadnoughts will uh, ultimately attack nothing. <laughs> They were trying, they were trying, but they just weren't able to hit anything. And not often do you see a bullfrog get killed by a, by a Kirov, but it does happen. It does happen occasionally. And also something you don't see very often. Oh, he's gonna get both of them as well. Both of those dreadnoughts pulled into the rocks and sent down to Davy Jones' locker. That's the end of that. Cryogeddon fires off. Twin Blade looking to end the game. And it's gonna be four Mirage tanks in the corner of the map tearing apart Blue Base, but ultimately they will be silenced by these Twin Blades. Blue Base in the corner gets shot up but the Mirage tanks get shut down and that will be it. Iron Curtain and Vacuum Imploder both are ready to go. Any moment now. Proton Collider five seconds away. There are just so many places to potentially use the Proton Collider. Same with the Vacuum Imploder. Iron Curtain will fire off on these Akula subs. And uh, well, that'll help win blue. That'll help blue win this fight even harder. And I guess uh, blue's gonna get rid of the iron curtain and the vacuum imploder. So I'm not sure where he fired that off at. What? Where did where did Yonic stuff go? 
Yannick had a vacuum imploder that was at zero and then sold it off, but I can't find where he vacuum imploded. Uh, I don't know what just happened. Yannick uh, just did nothing. I must have missed where the vacuum imploder landed. It must have hit like only units or smashed into the water or something. And uh, I just... There should be some some areas of destruction where we should be able to see what just happened. But uh, I don't know. Natasha, is she about to get sniped again? Sheesh, it never ends with her. Annihilated time and time again. Sentry bombers are here. Yannick, 214,000 total resources gathered. And I guess decides, nope, I don't want a vacuum imploder. Double chronosphere ready to go. We still haven't even really seen a chronosphere. Sentry bombers drop their payloads, clear out a refinery. We still haven't really seen a chronosphere on. Oh, and here we get it. Finally, we get the play we were looking for. Tanya gets immediately jumped and the blood peacekeeper is pushing tanya around are you kidding me and then the toxic sludge on top of that oh and the chronosphere no the chronosphere attempt to snipe tanya it doesn't work i don't know what that play was i don't know what he chronosphered where uh uh oh he meant to chronosphere that stuff out to the... Okay, he did. He chronosphered Tanya. I think he, he just nuked Tanya off screen. He was going to chronosphere this, these IFVs and the, these mirages somewhere, and then he changed his mind, and he decided to chronosphere Tanya. But, uh, well, GGOT has been defeated. Team Green starting to fall apart. Team Blue, they have a ton of cash. And it is taking them a little while to actually be able to finish off this game. But they will eventually get there. Kirov is circling. Sentry Bomber's coming in for another pass. Silver Surfer. I mean, I don't know that he really has much of a chance to do anything. Bombs getting dropped. Oh, I just realized. I think I can do something. Ah, look at that. Uh-oh, that's not good. That's a bug. Okay, go back. <laughs> that was, uh, the defeated status got transferred to the wrong player. So that's a bug we'll have to work on. There we go. Uh, Kirov goes golden gets the super reactor as well i thought i was going to be able to swap the uh the order of the players in the list which i can do but then the defeated status was conferred a wrong, uh, uh, to the wrong players so we will just have to live with this and the kirov survives a fully heroic kirov going for the maximum bombs APOC tanks making their way. Kirov dropping those bombs. Blue dominating for the last five to ten minutes. But it's still not over because Silver Surfer refuses to leave the game. There was there was a period of time where like maybe Green could have done something. It would have been a long road to victory. They would have they would have uh, you know needed blue to make some big mistakes or blue to play a little bit slower and a little bit worse. But Yannick and Zorminator just kind of kept up the expansion, kept up the pressure, never really stopped. And sure, they maybe made mistakes, but everyone made mistakes in this game, and their mistakes were no worse than anyone else's. They didn't like they didn't lose an entire army as it crosses the bridge, or like just sit there as fifty grand worth of units disappears. So. They didn't really make any major mistakes. They just expanded a lot and maybe got lucky with their, with the fact that green was fighting orange and red a little bit more. And then orange and red were the, 
were the weaker team and blue was able to take over their position. So it's just easier when you're on the outside to stay on the outside and oh my gosh. Those MiGs just getting absolutely annihilated. And maybe this Kirov will go down as well, but of course it just doesn't matter. Kirov sniped. Proton Collider fires off. Might as well get the time bomb as well. Oh, and the satellite! All three! Time bomb, proton collider, and satellite all joining forces to uh, to blast apart that area. Twin blades, always the hero of the 2v2v2. And uh, Silver Surfer, is that his last building that counts? It was indeed, and that's the GG. The end of the game, 31 minutes long. And, uh, well, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all very much for watching. And this is Cybert signing out.